Okay. I believe we're recording. Recording light is on. Oh, it is indeed. All right. Welcome to weekly CES meeting. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, in previous week, I've uh, discussed um, proposing adding a uh, a load method to the compartment API. And the purpose of the load method would be to um, induce the loading of all of the modules needed to execute a particular entry point, um, such that after the promise returned by load, you could immediately call import now and um, be guaranteed that the working set was already there. Um, the reason for wanting to expose this API is to make it possible to write a tool that would uh, construct an archive of the working set by providing an import hook that would record all of the modules that had been, uh, had been imported in order to, uh, to satisfy the, the dependency graph for the particular entry point module. Um, and uh, this is part of the, the motivating use case for us at Agoric is we would like to be able to construct an archive of an, uh, of an entire application that can be executed on a chain or, um, and, I, and there are uh, obvious applications of the same idea for just straightforward um, uh, constructing bundles for production of, uh, of a particular web application. So basically providing the mechanism that it would allow you to use the compartment API in order to implement something like Browserify or, um, or Webpack or, or Rollup or whatever, or what have you, um, with the intention of surfacing individual modules. Um, so uh, let me share my screen and host disabled attendee screen sharing. Michael, would it be possible to extend mm. screen share? Um, see, see if you can do it now. Brilliant. Uh, believe that this is the tab. Yep. Okay. All right. So, um, this is a, a, a straw man I'm calling endo, um, as endo is means within, right? And it's an anagram of node or Dino. And, you know, it implies much more than it is. Uh, but uh, so uh, I've, I've proposed a stack of changes uh, that would allow us to execute node style applications um, in uh, uh, with one compartment per package, um, and a similar uh, uh, similar to the way that you can do a lava moat, except this would basically be a reimplementation of the core of lava moat in terms of the compartment API, um, and uh, so it would provide. Let me show you. Um, probably best place to start is the design. Um, this this depicts the. Each of these is one of the functions that uh, is part of the public API of the endo package. So import from path, load from path, uh, write an archive, make an archive and get the bytes, or parse an archive from bytes, load an archive from the file system, or execute an archive end to end. Um, the sort of the there are three major use cases. One is I want to execute an application off of the file system as if it were Node calling as, as if you were saying node in the name of a, of a file that's the entry point module. Um, and then uh, write archive, which would be the same thing, except instead of executing, it creates a zip file. Um, and then import from archive, which takes that zip file and uh, accepts whatever endowments you want and built in modules to thread into that and then uh, resume as if it had been loaded from the file system up front. Um, and in order to make this work, there are a, couple, there are a small number of common, um, common facilities that make all of this possible. The, the, the asterisks is denote um, uh, 
components that are used in the workflow for each of these functions. Um, so first up is finding the package JSON that is in the containing directory for the module that you wish to execute as your entry point. Um, and then constructing a compartment graph. And the way this works is it goes to the package JSON and looks at its dependencies array or dependencies object as it were. Um, and then does as node would search up the, up the parent and ancestor directories until it finds a, uh, uh, an existing package JSON under node modules package name package JSON. Um, and then builds that out transitively until it has all of the package JSONs it needs uh, to describe all of the compartments that would be needed to execute the application in compartments. Um, and the result of this is a compartment map, which is sort of similar in spirit to an import map. Um, but the format is, uh, is built around the compartment API. So there's a section in the compartment map for every compartment that needs to be created. And, all of, and, and it contains uh, an array of all of the modules that need to be, um, or pardon, an object that describes how to construct the module map for that compartment um, by uh, linking it to the uh, exports of other compartments. Um, and then uh, assembling the compartments is just a matter of doing a, a traversal over the graph, constructing all of the compartment objects. Um, and then you call load, you would call load just to load and you would call import to load and then execute. Um, so the compartment map looks like this, um, where there's a top level object that contains the compartments and could um, with, with extensions, uh, it, 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 there's a clear path to extend the compartment map to also have named realms um, so that you could say this compartment is to be in this realm, that compartment is to be in that realm, which would allow you to um, have some of the flexibility to run things that, uh, that aren't able to share a single frozen realm. Um, and then uh, tags are basically, is this design, is, is, this a, is, this an, is this a compartment map that was built for a browser or front end or what have you? Um, so the compartment description individually says, here's the root on the file system or within an archive. Um, and this piece of information informs how to construct an import hook for the compartment uh, because the import hook is going to receive module specifiers um, from, the spec, spe, uh, from the perspective of a particular compartment um, and needs to be able to, uh, to locate the fully qualified location of the corresponding module in order to, uh, to, to, to parse and provide the static module record. And then the modules map is very similar in, uh, it's very similar to the module map that gets passed in through the compartment constructor, except that it describes uh, the compartment name of the compartment that provides the module and then the module specifier from within that compartment. Um, and then there's, there are clear ways that you could extend this in order to, to thread built-in modules or whatever, um, or, or shimmed modules for that matter. Um, yeah, and then the rest of it is, is an exercise for the future for um, possibly being able to thread endowments and, and built-in modules to different compartments and also um, uh, and denote realms. Um, and the notion is that someday we might be able to use, uh, we might be able to use this as a foundation for lava moat or, um, or share a whole bunch with lava moat for the static analysis of all of your packages in order to create um, a, a set of min the minimum necessary policy uh, in order to thread the uh, empowered built-in modules and any other uh, powerful objects in and, and even whether to use realms or compartment or the frozen, a uh, shared frozen realm uh, could be inferred by static analysis of the package at a particular version and construct a policy and then weave that policy into the resulting compartment map. Um, so that's, that's the design in a nutshell. Um, the usage, uh, let me move this bar. Uh, it, the usage looks like um, there's import path, 
which you give the power to read the file system and uh, a module pass and any endowments and modules you wish to thread into the main compartment of, uh, of, of that application. And by default, and as, as written today so far, um, the only that, that in powerful objects and through endowments or built-in modules are only passed to the application and third-party packages receive nothing. Um, they only have the ability to compute and it's an exercise for the future to make it possible to thread some of these endowments and built-in modules selectively to other packages. Um, and then write archive gives, uh, you pass it the ability to write a file to the file system and the ability to read files and then uh, note the name of the archive you wish to write and the entry point. And it goes through the process of collecting everything and putting it in a zip file. And then import archive, give a, you give uh, ability to read, you give the path of the archive, um, and then pass endowments and modules. So those are the, those are the three um, major use cases for this. There, there are possible ways that you could uh, use a lot of the same internal mechanism to then also implement something like Browserify or um, possibly some other more interesting things. Um, so this motivates, the, the, so the, the, the core of this that motivates the need to add a load method and the module method to the compartment, uh, to the compartment specification is this assemble method which takes the compartment map um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a function for making an import hook for a particular compartment based off of the path of its root module um, uh, that goes and transitively visits the compartment map constructing compartments um, right down here. And uh, the, uh, th so this, uh, this requires the use of the module function um, in order to thread the, a, a package, a, a, pardon, a module from a dependency package into the module map of, uh, of the dependee compartment. Uh, and so this, this function in here is going through all of the modules that this thing depends upon and injects, uh, and injects the module namespace object into its module map um, and, then, and then constructs it. And then, uh, then you can then you can execute the compartment at the you can execute the module at the root compartment. Um, the so the trick is that if you are making an archive, which is not in this hash. One moment. Uh, files. There it is. Um, the trick is that <clears throat> when you're making an archive, you then, after you've assembled your archive, need the ability to induce the, uh, induce the root compartment to load, uh, to, to, to call the import hook for everything that's loaded. And that's right here. Um, so, I, I get the root compartment by assembling a compartment graph, and then I call load on the module specifier. And what this does is it induces um, the import hooks, which are using this make recording, recording import hook maker, um, which goes and not just gets the module, but also as a side effect, um, makes a record in the manifest of all of the all of the modules that were needed in order to build the archive, um, and then and captures them so that they can be added to a zip file, um, which is all right down here. Uh, make archive, yeah, add sources to archive. So it it goes and grabs those sources that were built up by the import hook and then adds them uh, adds them to the zip file, and the implementation of this change is just this. So as you can see, the async import method is uh, implemented in terms of an internal load method. And once your trend, and once your working set has fully loaded, it then uses import now to execute that module and any of, and all of them, all of the modules it depends upon. 
uh, that have not yet already executed and then returns the module namespace. Um, load is just uh, the front end of that without the back end exposed or without the execution at the end. And um, yeah, so that's the entirety of my presentation and proposal. Uh, I will resign the screen. I had uh, some thoughts as you were describing the API. So I don't know why. Oh, I didn't think of these when, when you were talking about this the other day. Um, even more curious why Mark didn't. But um, the import uh, archive or import, the thing that imports the, from the zip file. Mm -hmm. And the thing that generates the zip file. And in general, anything that does file IO in your API, um, you have it being passed um, uh, a, a file system, you know, an FS method of some kind, FS object of some kind, and a path name. Um, and then in, a, in a more OCAP y style, I, and then and this may not get along with the, the zip library that you're using, but um, you, we think you want to pass in a thing which is just a an IO, IO path to the specific file that you want to read or write rather than allowing um, um, sort of arbitrary path names to be. Um, yes, ideally, ideally that would be possible. Um, I, to that end, uh, that's what all of the other layers of the API are about um, for how to, um, how to do this without um, full access to a file system. Um, The trick in this particular case is that the user who calls node in a file name does not actually know um, where all of the transitive dependencies are and is not in a position to grant specific authority to specific individual files. The, um, the write archive method and the import path method both um, require the ability to explore the file system to find where all of those packages are um, in order to build out the in order to build out the package graph the um, a neat a neat effect of this is that you can end up with an archive and the archive when, when you execute from an archive um, it only needs the ability to read within the scope of that archive um, which which greatly attenuates the authority of the um, of the mechanism. Yeah, you just uh, so for that case, you can actually use um, parse archive. Uh, yeah, if you use parse archive directly, you just give it a bag of bytes um, from the zip file, um, and it requires no further authority in order to construct the compartment graph and execute it. Um, yeah, I didn't know to what extent, for example, um, reading a zip file, particularly a large one, requires the ability to do seek. Yeah, um, I'm assuming at the moment that we do not need to do that. Uh, the, my presumption is that the entire archive can fit in memory, um, which seems like, which is a reasonable assumption until there are significant assets embedded in the application. Um, significant, significant non-code assets embedded in the application. Um, the the code is going something. The the application will require the entire working sets um, source text to a be in memory at some point. Maybe immediately discarded, but at some point it needs to all be in memory, um, and uh, or at least. The, uh, something, some amount of memory will be need to need to be consumed that is proportionate to the amount of source code in the archive. Um, so I'm not worried about that case. Uh, I would be, I am worried about, say, if you take a dependency on, I don't know, an emoji font, um, and your code needs access to all of those resources. At at that point, 
um, we'll, we'll probably need to come up with something more clever where the, the zip file gets mem mapped or something. Sorry, so if you have other dependencies outside of uh, JavaScript, are you saying those would not be part of the archive? Um, I am actually suggesting that all of those assets would be part of the archive. And if those assets are significant in size, then it might become a problem um, uh, that we might have to rework the implementation, but not the interface um, in order to accommodate very large application archives. So how does that get included? Is that through an import? Like uh, I'm thinking of Webpack. I don't, I don't know. Um... Uh, I don't know, roll up or, or, or uh, Agoric's. Uh, yeah, so, but, so Agoric has not mentioned a requirement for this yet. Uh, but I imagine that there, I imagine that we will eventually need to be able to embed assets in archives um, and also provide some, and, and, and that this system would need to provide some sort of API that would work exactly the same way if you were executing it in development locally or in a web page or on blockchain, and I I consider it a uh, um, table stakes <laughs> to solve that problem in some way. Um, that most I, I do not feel that that is a generally solved problem though. Um, roll up ignores the issue. Um, it only deals with source assets. Uh, I think that there might be plugins. Browserify has a solution with a plugin where if your package um, uses the node FS API in order to do dot read file sync of statically uh, of static strings. Um, it will do some static analysis behind the scenes in order to figure those things out and then give a low power uh, FS built in module to your package when it's running in the browser that would give it the ability to use the same code running on both sides, just pretending that it has a full node API in order to do, um, uh, use the double under, or the dunder dir name and dunder file name files in order to find, uh, in order to find assets in the same package. I find that deeply dissatisfying. Um, uh, I know that, uh, uh, shame Dan didn't hang around because he's, he's proposing the, um, the module attributes proposal that would, um, give us uh, some language foundation for being able to import assets um, into modules in some way or another. Uh, a previous project I did um, uh, for Motorola and Montage was uh, uh, did have an ability to to um, uh, uh, to give users the ability to refer to static assets and carry them around and discover them and carry them around into um, production workflows on the web. But um, it, it was sort of half finished. Um, and it would be, I think it would be really cool to solve that problem. I think Webpack, um, it might be similar to what you're saying about Browserify um, in that you, you would have a plugin that that's external to your application that runs as part of the webpack process, um, which understands based on the file extension, uh, how to acquire that file and incorporate mm -hmm. it into the archive yeah. or with the bundle or whatever it is. Yeah, the montage had HTML modules that were, um, uh, and, and like it, it, the, the concept could have been extended to CSS even, the, just, in incorporating CSS and HTML into the module system in order to build whole applications with these multi-language assets is um, very powerful. Um, because a lot of these, like CSS doesn't have the notion of a linker and it doesn't have a notice, notion of a package manager. So a reference in, a, in a, um, a URL embed in a CSS file isn't something that's portable through um, uh, through the module system um, and can't be properly bundled. Um, we're a long way to, from having a solution to that problem generally, but uh, I, yeah. Well, can I ask, um, so the, it sounds like the 
the bundling process of endo I, I don't know if it's the assemble or the archive side of things but it, it's requiring that the application code is running if i understand correctly and because it, the application code uh, inside the compartment needs to call the import hook in order to know what asset gets included uh, am i understanding that cor uh, correctly uh, uh, the specific the motivation specifically for adding a load um, method to the compartment api is is exactly to avoid needing to execute the application um, the uh, a static module record is um, is 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 basically a functor that you would that you would call in order to execute the module. It's not exactly that, but it closes over effectively a functor for executing the module, um, and uh, one might call it an as Chip was alluding to possibly early. Oh no, no, Chip was saying that you would inspect an archive with an endoscope um, and as someone else on the team was suggesting that you would have an endo functor. Um, any, any, the, um, the, the, uh, the, idea, the idea is that when you construct a static module record from a module source text and yes, it, it would, does not execute it, but it does because ECMAScript modules um, have statically an analyzable dependencies, it's able to um, extract the, the shallow dependency references from the source text and then present that to the compartment API. And then the compartment API goes and visits those shallow, um, uh, vis visits the shallow dependency graph to create the whole transitive dependency graph without executing anything. It okay, parses. I understand. It parses. So, so is, is this the, um, the, the intention then is not for this to work with dynamic import then? Would, would that yeah. be correct? Uh, so not generally. Um, if you wished for dynamic, um, so dynamic import is, is of limited, has limited facility. Right, um, the especially through a bundling transform, um, something that you can do with dynamic import before and after is say, um, uh, uh, let's just say that because the entry points are not discoverable, there is not much meaningful work you can do with dynamic import in the context of an archived application, um, and. Uh, but you could, in your package, Jason, describe all of the valid dynamic entry points you wish if you're using dynamic import for lazy execution, lazy loading, um, which, is a, which is a common use for dynamic import, is to do like, uh, what is it called nowadays? Um, oh man, splitting. What is, Webpack had this, has this feature, a code splitting, I think is what they're calling it. In any case, where you can, where you can have explicit um, explicit checkpoints where you provide progressively enhanced behavior while um, while gradually loading in the behavior of your application, um, and you could use dynamic import for that, and you could use dynamic import for that inside of an archived application. You just need to give, you would need to give uh, a tool like the Endo Archiver a hint about what all of the entry points are going to be. Um, uh, to wit, uh, one of the things that I see as a potential for Endo is the ability to provide a, a, a normal API for worker modules. And by normal, I mean a portable API for worker modules. Um, there's the trouble with workers with archiving and bundling is the same as uh, dynamic import, right? Where your entry points are dynamic um, and they might even be on the web. They might not even be part of your archive, but they probably ought to be. Um, and if that's the case, what, uh, but yeah, and then, and then there's the issue that, that um, uh, when you do a dynamic import, what was, I mean, your refer is your module refer, but with a worker constructor, you pass a URL. And what is uh, the, the worker constructor does not close over your refer URL, uh, which makes it pretty uh, 
useless. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so one of the things that we could do with a system like Endo is have uh, express in your pack package JSON what are the entry points for workers in your module, and then have Endo present constructors for all of those workers as endowments into the same package um, with the machinery behind the scenes um, being, for one, different if it's being deployed to the web or a blockchain or, um, or, or just locally on your own host, um, like using the node worker API or using the service worker API or using of the web worker API or what have you. Um, or uh, whatever worker you have on 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 a on a on an IoT device, um, th that could be generalized by expressing in package JSON. This is my entry point. Please give me a constructor for a worker um, uh, with that entry point, um, and uh, that would allow Endo to discover that and also load the transitive working uh, the transitive working set of all of those workers. Um, and then include them in the archive. Um, um, th there, there are more interesting complications with that because uh, there are three, I think, sensible worker calling conventions um, to which I say, let's just anticipate that there's going to be more than one, um, one type of worker API exposed in package JSON, one for workers that communicate with an IO stream uh, of, with binary data, another um, another worker API that communicates with an object stream using async iterators, um, and another one that would use something that would be built on top of CAPTP, where you get when you when you instantiate the worker, you would get a promise for the module, uh, a promise for the exported module, uh, exported namespace of the entry module of the worker, and be able to um, use eventual use eventual send to communicate with the worker. Um, and possibly, um, possibly making uh, swings our uh, agoric swing set part of the foundation. Perhaps workers um, sort of fall into the same category as other types of non JavaScript resources. You know, the way that they are loaded at runtime uh, is 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 different from a typical module. Um, yeah, as you say, you might have an async iterator that accesses it or something. Mm -hmm. um, maybe CSS and HTML imports would would be similar in that you you don't have a JavaScript API. It, it doesn't export an, a JavaScript API that's directly accessible by the importer. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting point because it could this could be with module attributes, you could construct an attribute that says, hey, instead of importing this module, please give me the constructor for a worker for this module. Um, that, that's another another possible approach. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Does anybody else have any thoughts about this? I like it. I need to. Uh, I need to digest it a bit. I'll probably go through some of the code. I think one of the one of the things this addresses that I think was a um, I think a bit of an oversight in the original. Um, original loader proposal that uh, Dave Herman was working on back at the dawn of time um, is it was always, a, there was, and, and this has been an issue with the, the JavaScript module system in general, is there's always been a bit of a hand waving and then a miracle happens aspect to the question of where does the code actually come from? And uh, part of that was wanting to defer um, to, to not to not commit in the uh, in the spec to any particular um, mapping of, of names to files or URLs or any any of that kind of thing, which I which I agree with. But the notion uh, still remains that there's going to be some kind of I/O operation to get bits from somewhere. 
Um, and that was always kind of waved off as, oh, well, we'll have a loader API for that at some point. And um, um, this actually confronts that issue. And I, that's one of the things I like. Well, we're an hour in almost. Um, uh, and I have, I, I don't believe there's anything else on the agenda. So um, I feel like, I feel like there has to be some other topics that we're, <laughs> that we're forgetting to address here. Oh yeah. Um, uh, if, uh, it, it sounds like there's not much more to be said about this. I'll just, um, I'll make the proposal for the specification um, and refer to this recording for the explanation of the design and also to the um, the design and rationale documentation for it. Um, and uh, yeah, and the floor is open for topics. I haven't prepared for um, uh, continuum Continuing on Alex's topic, we, we did a, uh, Alex previously proposed that we review um, the TC39 proposals that are relevant to CES, and we have covered a subset of them um, uh, for, in preparation for TC39, which was enormously helpful. Um, thanks to Alex to, for recommending that we go over that. I know that the focusing specifically on the, the queue for TC39 wasn't the original intent, but it was certainly um, a useful effect. Um, and um, perhaps we should uh, perhaps we should resume in that in that vein um, and looking at some of the some of the other proposals. I unfortunately don't have enough. I don't have any context on any proposal that I. <laughs> that it, uh, has happened in the last five years. Um. <laughs> one, one of the things I've noticed about uh, this particular series of meetings is um, whenever it's the week after TC39 plenary, everybody's brains have basically been drained of agenda. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe that's a reason where we should postpone that for the next meeting. I think that that's probably for the best. Um, and uh, it seems reasonable to give you all an hour back um, uh, or give ourselves an hour back unless there's more to talk, talk about. Um, uh, Michael, would you like to stop the recording?